Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Matt. In this series, we're going to take our first look at the question, is there a God? I think quite a lot of people already have their minds made up on this question, though some people perhaps don't. But I want all of us, regardless of our position, to take a minute and ask the question whether or not we believe in God, and ask the question, why do we think there either is or is not a God? Let's suppose a friend of ours, you know, not not somebody hostile, somebody, you know, open-minded and willing to listen. Suppose a friend of ours asked us why we thought there either was or was not a God. How would we respond? Would we have any good reasons to think the way we do? I think most of the time, most of us just focus on the conclusions. We say we think this or we think that. I really can't give any good reasons. And so we can't have good discussions because all we do is we look at the conclusions rather than the reasoning. When I was beginning my doctoral work in New Testament, my advisor told me, Matt, you live in Atlanta. What I want you to do is go to the library at Emory University one of the best theological libraries in the world. And what I want you to do is look at all the commentaries on Colossians. Colossians being one of Paul's letters and the focus of my dissertation. I said, really? All commentaries? He said, yes, all commentaries. And you do not care what their conclusions are. You are only concerned with their reasoning. Why do they think the way they do? Then what you do is that you imagine you place all these books around a very large table, each book representing the opinions of its author, and then you have a discussion. Write down that discussion. That will be your dissertation. Now, the point that he made to me is that it's the reasons that are important. We will get to the conclusion eventually, but the way we make sure that we get to the right conclusion is by making sure that we look at the reasons rather than just skipping over everything and going straight to the end. If all we do is look at the conclusions, then basically what's going to happen is we're just going to pick our favorite point of view and go with that. Or we'll take a vote and the conclusion with the biggest number of supporters wins. Now, the problem is neither one of those is really a good way to figure out truth. So what we need to do is we need to take a look at the reasons for things. And incidentally, this helps us have better conversations, because if all you do is focus on the conclusions, there's no conversation. You just say, I think this, you think that, that's it. If we agree, then we get along. If not, then perhaps we fight, or we just don't have anywhere to go with it. So looking at the reasons for things not only helps us have better conversations, but it helps us get at better conclusions. So in this series, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at why we do or do not think there is a God. We're going to see if there's any reason to believe that a God exists. And I'm going to lay out one of the arguments for God's existence, explain it, and give my opinion. And as we go through this, I'm encouraging you to think about your opinion. You're totally free to disagree with me. I'm simply trying to share the process with you that I've gone through in thinking through what I believe. Because, in the end, if I'm wrong, I want to know. So, here we go. Our goal is to try to figure out whether there is a God or not. So how do we do that? Well, the way we do this is to first take a look at the world around us and look in places we might expect to find God's tracks, if you will, and see what we find. And after that, we try to draw some conclusions from what we find. This is what both theists and atheists do. This is not a religious way of going about things, nor is it a non-religious way of going about things. We're simply looking for clues and trying to figure out which way the evidence points. That's pretty straightforward. So, where do we look? Well, there's quite a lot of places we might look, and given that a god's probably big, then we should probably look in some pretty big places. So, we might look at the origin of the universe, and that's one of the places that people very frequently, on on all sides of this uh, argument, look to try to see whether a god was involved. You might expect a god to be involved, for example, in the creation of the universe. And so there's a whole set of arguments called the cosmological arguments, uh, most known as the Kalam cosmological argument, 
which looks at the origin of the universe and tries to ask a question of, was there a cause for the universe? Uh, the argument goes, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe had a cause. And scientific and mathematical arguments are made to try to show that the universe did have an have a beginning and then using the principle of causality that if you have a cause there must excuse me if you have an effect and then there must have been a cause we try to say well the universe is an effect it hasn't been around for forever so something must have caused it and so that's one of the ways people try to get to showing that there's a cause for the universe and the cause of that would then have to be God there's a lot of reasons for all of the points in there we're not going to go over all of them I'm just trying to give you an idea of how people look at this question. Uh, something else from the beginning of the universe is what's uh, known as a, one of the teleological arguments, where you say, okay, well, the universe was created. Does it show any design inherent in it? When you look at the creation of, or not the creation of, but when you look at certain constants, certain figures and things that are sort of put in to the universe from its origin. Does it look like it was designed? Does this look like something that we would have expected to see? Is, is this universe that we see sort of like, do the laws guarantee that this particular type of universe would happen? Or did it just come about by chance? So is it law, chance, or design? Another thing we might do for looking for God is look for specific examples of how God interacted in the world so-called miracles. Uh, on Christianity, obviously, most of the focus is on the resurrection of Jesus, not only because it shows that there's a God, it points at a specific one, uh, the Christian God. And to look into the resurrection, what you do is you look at all of the primary source documents, the things that are closest to the actual events, the places where we're likely to find the most accurate information about the resurrection, and try to see, is there any good reason to think that it happened on historical grounds? It's not assuming that there's a God. It's not assuming that the Bible or anything else is accurate or even generally trustworthy. It's simply looking at the question as an historian would. Is there any reason to think that Jesus actually rose from the dead? So those are three ways you might go about looking to see, is there any evidence in favor of God's existence? However, there are some things that we need to consider besides just things in favor of God's existence. We're trying to get a well-rounded picture here. So what we need to do is look at things that might count against God's existence as well. For example, the problem of evil. Okay, if we're talking about a good God, how could a good God allow bad things to happen? You know, there's, there's quite a lot of things in this world that don't seem to match up with the idea that most theists give, that there is a benevolent God who cares about us and so forth, because if there is a God who cares for us, why does he let so many terrible things happen? And there have been attempts to try to show that logically it is impossible for God to exist when there's evil in the world. And there have been attempts to try to show that, okay, well, you can't logically prove that a God couldn't exist, but it seems very unlikely given that there's so much evil in the world. Another way to go about it is to look at specific actions of God. If we're talking about a specific God, say the God of the Old Testament, it seems like he commanded people to commit genocide. Well, that doesn't sound like a very good God or the sort of God that might really be the one that we're talking about. It seems sort of like one that humans would make up to justify their own actions. Or we might talk about other specific actions of God like the existence of hell. Why would a good and loving God create a place to torture people for all eternity? And things like this. And to give a third thing to balance this out, some people have tried to show that there are logical contradictions in the nature of God. For example, certain of God's attributes like justice and mercy are contradictory. And so a God cannot be fully just and fully merciful at the same time. And so because that's impossible, therefore God is an impossible being and cannot exist.
you see what's going on here. Both arguments in favor of God's existence and arguments against God's existence are attempts to look at the world and to try to understand the way things are set up, try to understand the way the world around us looks. And really what we're trying to do is get a picture of the world around us and see whether it makes sense to say that a God exists or see whether it makes better sense to say that God does not exist. And as you can see, it's going to take quite a lot of time to survey even a handful of these because the world is fairly big. In this series, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at one of the places people have looked for the evidence of a god. We're looking specifically at what, at what is known as the moral argument. So, what is morality? Now, I think when most of us hear the word morality, we tend to think of a small group of old people who don't know how to have any fun, giving us a list of rules to make sure that we don't have any fun either. And that's not what I mean when I talk about morality. What we're trying to figure out is something much more basic, much more foundational, and much more important than anything like that. We want to know if there are any principles that help the human creature function more effectively. For example, if we're talking about cars, we know that it is important to make sure that we put fuel into them because if we don't, then they're not going to run. Similarly, if we don't change the oil, then eventually our car is going to have problems. We all know this. As a side note, yes, I know electric cars function differently, but it's merely a difference of degree. You still need to add electricity or they won't run, and while they don't need oil changes like gas-powered vehicles, they still need maintenance. So the point that there are certain functional issues inherent to the vehicle that must be considered for the thing to run properly, that's still the same. Side note over. On the humans. To use a similar and still mechanical example, if you try to pick up something heavy off the ground and you let your background while you do it, you increase your chances of injury. Why? Well, because physics. Incidentally, that's the same answer as with a car. Because of the way your back works, if you leave your back in a rounded position, you add extra stress to a small area rather than spreading that stress out over a large area. Will you get hurt every time you lift incorrectly? Probably not. Will you increase your chances of injury? Absolutely. In our discussion of morality, we will be focusing primarily on something called objective moral values. I said a while back that I was going to try to avoid technical terms as much as I possibly could, but I cannot avoid this one. You simply must learn what it means for a moral value to be objective if we're going to have this conversation. Don't worry though, I'm going to explain it, and really you're already about halfway there. We talked about cars and human bodies operating on basic foundational principles, in this case coming from physics. And we also saw that these principles help us to understand how these things are supposed to operate. When we're talking about an objective moral value, we're talking about the same sort of thing. We're looking for an answer to the question, are there any basic foundational principles that say how humans should operate in relation to ourselves, other people, the world around us, and so forth? So that's what we're looking for. But I need to ask another question, though. What's the point of this? You know, all this stuff might be really interesting, and that's great, but we're still left with the question, what's the point? Well, the point is that it makes a huge difference if God exists or not. The question of God's existence gets at some of the most foundational questions that we have. For example, is this life all that there is? You know, how you decide to spend your time here on earth makes a huge difference whether there's anything that comes after this or not. If this is all there is, then you live with that understanding. If there's something else, then perhaps you should pay attention to whatever that something else is. We also ask the question a lot of times, is there any purpose to our lives? So what do, what do we do with, with our lives here? Do we, do we have an inherent purpose that we're here for some reason? Or do we make purpose for ourselves? And both of these get to the other question, like how should I live or act now? And this argument that we're talking about in particular touches on this question. What do I do now? How do I live today? How do I live tomorrow? 
How do I conduct myself in the time that I have here? You know, most major issues people argue about today are issues because of something that's more basic or more foundational. Take politics, for example. If you ask a question like how much control should the government have or what is the role of government, you're going to get very different responses from people. So anytime that something else comes up, say uh, an argument about should there be a, a minimum wage or what level should it be, people are going to have very, very different responses which may or may not have a whole lot to do with the issue as much as it has to do with something that's more foundational, like what is the role of government? How much should they be involved in what's going on? How much should they keep their hands out of what's going on? You see what I'm saying? Anytime that there's something that's a, you know, whether it's a financial policy, whether it's a moral policy or something, A lot of times people's more foundational ideas about what should be happening in the government are going to weigh in on some specific issue that's happening. And this is why people get really, really upset or really, really fired up about something that seems to be not as important as the level of enthusiasm, shall we say, that they're putting into it. And in the end, politics is a more minor issue because It really is addressing the question of how we can function together, even though we're different. But we're talking about something deeper than that. How should we function? You know, what is man? What are are we here for? Is there anything bigger than just this life? So when we're talking about God's existence, we're asking probably the most foundational question there could possibly be on any subject. Because it touches on everything else and how you answer everything else is going to be reflected from this first question. How do you view the world? Is there a God or not? So this is the task that we're setting in front of ourselves. We're asking the question, is there a God? And we're setting out trying to figure out, is there any reason to think one way or the other? And the way we're doing that here is we're looking at one particular argument in favor of God's existence, or not in favor of God's existence. We're looking at how humans function, and we're trying to figure out, does this imply that there is a God, or does this not imply that there is a God? So, in the next episode, what we're going to do is we're going to go into more detail about the difference between objective moral values and subjective moral values, and really focus on what the difference between the two is. Because that's really the key to this whole thing. Most people miss. Most people miss this argument or don't understand this argument because they don't understand what objective means. So we're going to go into detail about that in the next episode. So before then, what I want you to do is I want you to take some time and start thinking about actions and think about attitudes that we might have towards other people. You know, is love good? Is murder bad? Should you show up on time to a dinner invitation? Should you burp after that dinner is over? Are all of these things the same? Are they on the same level? Is there a difference between these and why? So I understand this might seem a little fuzzy right now. I really just wanted to introduce you to the idea and sort of paint in broad strokes. Next time we're going to look at this in more detail and hopefully clear things up a bit. Remember how the laws of physics apply to both cars and human bodies? Take some time and think about whether there are any basic principles, like those of physics, that apply to humans and how they interact with other people and the world around them. I've put a link on my website that you might find helpful on this and similar issues, so if you want to check that out, go to mattdelacre.com and click on the link. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>